I think our speaker today doesn't uh, probably need a lot of introduction. Tom Luna has been superintendent of schools in the state of Idaho since 2006. He was elected uh, to that office after a couple of terms on the Nampa School Board and some time in Washington, D.C. Uh, with the uh, education of the United States Department of Education. And then he was re-elected in 2010 uh, by, the, uh, by the voters of the state of Idaho. Uh, as, as you know, there are some controversial issues in the field of education reform. Idaho is, a number, is one of a number of states which has passed education measures. Uh, most of these were passed in 2011 by the legislature, and then we updated them this last winter and did some tweaks and uh, so forth. Tom's here to kind of introduce us to the program and uh, tell us what's happening with the Students Come First program, where it is in the state, and how it's being implemented. Please help me welcome Tom Luna. Thank you. It's, it's great to be here, and I appreciate that uh, introduction. I appreciate you taking time uh, to be here. Um, uh, Steve mentioned uh, education and controversy. My experience is that uh, as, as a father of six children, uh, the whole time that they were in school, the whole time I was in school, the whole time I've been state superintendent, everybody is interested in education because we've all been to school or we have children in school. And so it's always been uh, something that we, uh, that we talk about and we're concerned about, and, and, and rightfully so. Uh, it is uh, a thrill to have my granddaughter Chloe here. Chloe is uh, one of seven grandchildren, and uh, when they visit us from Las Vegas, I always uh, make it a point to take each of them with me at least one day so they can see what Papa does. And it just gives me some one-on-one -on -one time with them. But uh, I tell people that uh, grandchildren are the reward for not shooting them when they were teenagers. And uh, <laughs> uh, we uh, we just uh, our number eight grandchild our number eight grandchild is on the way, and we're just we're just blessed. Uh, let, let let me talk to you uh, uh, about the law of the land in Idaho, and that's the laws that were passed in 2011 by the legislature, uh, referred to as students come first. Uh, that year, uh, 30 states passed some form of education reform uh, around the country, and last year, another six or so joined. Uh, there's a renaissance going on all across the country in reforming education. It's not limited to red conservative states. It's not limited to blue liberal states. It's happening in, uh, in, in all states, uh, regardless of people's political persuasion, that the understanding uh, is that something needed to change. Uh, and, uh, the, and, and the debate wasn't to whether we had good schools or not. We were blessed with good schools in Idaho. The question is, in this world that we live in, are good schools going to prepare our children? Uh, and when you look at what our goal is for education in Idaho, our goal is, and this is a goal that was established by all the stakeholders in education, and that worked for two years to develop a very comprehensive plan for education, the Education Alliance. And they put forth a blueprint. And, and the vision uh, and the goal uh, stated amongst all the stakeholders is that every student will graduate from high school and go on to post-secondary education and they will not need remediation when they get there. That's our goal. Well, when we came into 2011 for uh, our legislative session, we, we recognize that in order to meet this goal, that we had some challenges that we were facing that, were, uh, that, that had to be addressed. And, and really, we were at a crossroads in education in Idaho and in, in many states across the country. There, there was converging circumstances that, that were forcing us to act. Um, there was uh, fiscal reasons, and there was academic reasons that we had to uh, look at our education system. Let me just talk to you quickly about the fiscal realities that we face. Um, you see from this uh, slide um, that uh, nine, go, go to the next slide, Lucy, real quick. You, you see that uh, because of a, a, a recession that was deeper and longer than any of us had ever experienced, you can see how uh, average funding per classroom in Idaho had gone down year after year after year. Basically, this is a result of the fact that 
you know, when Governor, Governor Otter and I first came into office, the first budget that the Governor Otter signed was for $3.6 billion. But the, the budget that was signed last year was for $2.5 billion. I mean, that's the decrease in revenues that Idaho and, and other states have experienced. And every source of revenue for the state had gone down. So we had these fiscal issues that we were facing. Uh, and, and the question was, do we just continue to dis financially cut and dismantle the education system that we have? Or do we look at changing the system so that we can actually educate more students at a higher level but with limited resources? We had an education system that required tens of millions of new dollars every year just to continue to do what we've done in the past. Just to maintain the status quo was an additional 20 or 30 million dollars a year. And if we wanted to do anything over and above that, necessary uh, professional development, needed technology, more opportunities for children. It cost us tens of millions of dollars over that. We recognized that the economy was not generating those revenues and it was not going to generate those kinds of revenues going forward, so we had to make a decision. Now, the other issue that we faced was academic. Idaho has good schools. Let, let me just say that again. Idaho has good schools. Let me give you some numbers. For every 100 children that go to school in Idaho, 92 of them graduate from high school. Um, Two-thirds of our schools are meeting the academic goals that we set for them. Just a few years ago, that was only 26%. Now it's almost two-thirds. Uh, there's only a handful of states whose students do better than Idaho students do in um, math. There's only about a dozen states whose students do better than Idaho students do in reading. Uh, and so you can see that if you look at us uh, uh, at, based on those numbers, that we, we have good schools. And, and we could stop and be satisfied with that, but let me share with you some more information. Um, of those 92 of our students that graduate from high school, only 46% go on to post-secondary education. So we go from one of the highest graduation rates in the country to one of the lowest of the percentage of students that go on after high school. Of those 46% that graduate or that go on to post-secondary education, 41% of them need remediation when they get there. In other words, they're not ready for the rigors of post-high school education. And then 38% of them do not go on to their second year. And what we end up with in Idaho then is 34% of our adult population that has some form of post-secondary certificate or degree. Now, why is that important? It's important because today, 60% of the jobs require more education than high school. That's today, and that number is only increasing. So we're not talking about everybody needing a four-year bachelor's degree. We're not even necessarily talking about everybody needing a two-year associate's. But what we're saying is that they have to have more education than just high school as demonstrated by a certificate in a trade or, uh, or professional technical or in a, tr you know, in a, a formal uh, associate's or bachelor's degree. But the fact is, these are the numbers today. And the fact is that today in America, three million jobs go wanting. In this high unemployment rate that we find ourselves, there are three million jobs that could be filled today if we had a workforce that had the skill level necessary. So there's an economic reason for this. Well, that's how we're performing uh, academically compared to the rest of the country. That's how we're performing when we look at uh, how, how our students are doing after high school. Let me give you one bit more bit of information. We want to know how our students are performing compared to the rest of the world, not just other states. So here is an assessment called PISA, P-I-S-A. Uh, this is an apples for apples comparison of how countries are doing academically. In, in, this, in this comparison, America ranks 49th. 49th in the world. That's who our children are going to compete with. Not just the kids from Utah or Maryland or, or, or Texas or Louisiana. They're going to compete on a global stage. And when I see some of these countries that are performing at the top, I'm not surprised who they are because they've been there for a long time and we know who they are. But I'm shocked that some of these countries that are outperforming us are countries that in our lifetime were living behind the Iron Curtain in oppression. And it's not that our schools aren't improving every year, 
It's just that these countries are improving a lot faster. Well, we not only wanted to see how America compared to the rest of the world, but we wanted to see how Idaho's children compared to the rest of the world. That's where we can focus our attention and our efforts. So we took this same assessment, and we treated each of our 50 states as if they were countries themselves. And we folded them into this model to see how we would compare. If Massachusetts was a country in and of itself, its students would rank 17th in the world academically. Not bad. Minnesota, 20th. Idaho, 71st. 71st. That's the world that we are graduating our children into. So when we look at these fiscal reasons, when we look at these uh, academic reasons, we really had some choices to make. One is denial, right? That seems to be a popular choice amongst many. We'll just deny that there's an issue at all and just continue to do what we've done in the past. The second option is, is we could do nothing. We could be satisfied with the fact that Idaho has good schools, that we have one of the highest graduation rates in the world, and that our students do well compared to other students around America. And we could completely ignore the fact that we have one of the lowest percentages of students that go on to post-secondary education, that too many of our students have to have remediation when they get to college, and we could ignore the fact that on an international stage, our students struggle. Or we could choose a third option, and that is to act. And that's what we chose to do, is to actually act. And we put together a plan based on, you know, work over a number of years that would actually create an education system where we could teach more students at a higher level, but with limited resources. And it, the name of that plan is called Students Come First. Let, let me talk to you of the about the law itself, the law of the land today. Um, the foundation of Students Come First is high academic standards for all students and advanced opportunities for all students. What we mean by high academic standards is we are lying to our children if we allow them to go through 12 or 13 years of public education, hold a community-wide event at the end of their senior year, walk them across the stage, pat them on the back, and hand them a diploma if we have not held them to the same high academic standards that every other country holds their students to. And Students Come First has done that. We have adopted an academic standard in math and reading and language uses that is equal to any other country in the world. And we are ramping up our education system to teach students at that high level. The second thing is we have to give students advanced opportunities. What every child in Idaho has today because of these laws is every child has the opportunity now to graduate from high school with a year's worth of college credits under their belt, all paid for by the state. Students now have the ability to take college level courses while they're in high school. The state pays for them. When they go on to college, they're actually enter their sophomore year. Now, that's an unbelievable financial opportunity for parents, right? But these are the kinds of opportunities that other children across America have. Why shouldn't students in Idaho and these laws provide that opportunity? Um, why, why do we, and, and we also now provide the opportunity for every high school student to take a college entrance exam. We know that as students take college entrance exams, more of them go on to education after high school. We know that as students earn 12 or more college credits while they're still in high school, 75% of them go on to education after high school. So we know from what we've learned it happening in other states that these are things that we can immediately do to increase the number of our students that are going on. Um, based on that foundation then are the three pillars of, no Ch of uh, students come first. It's the 21st century classroom, it's great teachers and leaders, and transparent accountability. Uh, let me talk to you about each of those uh, briefly. In a 21st century classroom, that is where learning is not limited by walls, it's not limited by bell schedules, it's not limited by school calendars, and it's definitely not limited by geography. It means that no matter where a child lives in Idaho, that they have equal access and opportunity for the highest quality uh, education, highest level instruction, and, and uh, highest uh, level of, uh, uh, of, of opportunity. That just did not exist before we passed these laws. We had children that lived in parts of Idaho that just because where they lived 
they did not have the same access and opportunity. So the proper implementation of technology gives students the ability to access the, uh, the, the, the courses that they need to succeed. Let, let me talk to you real quick about what this 21st century classroom is. It begins with connecting every high school to broadband, high-speed con uh, connections. We accomplished that. It took us three years, it cost about $42 million, but today every high school in Idaho is connected to the Idaho Education Network. They're not only connected to each other, but they're connected to every college and university in Idaho. And now students have access to instructors in every high school across the state. They have access to instructors in every college and university. Imagine the opportunities that provides for students that live in isolated parts of Idaho that struggle sometimes even to get basic high school courses. The, the second thing is we have to make sure that once we have the connectivity in every school, that every, and every school is a wireless environment, then every student has access to this opportunity. That's why we are moving towards an environment where every high school is a one-to-one -one ratio of student to computing device. Um, or, or, or laptop. Now, you would have thought that when we rolled out this idea that our plan was a ninth grader shows up the first day of school, we give them a laptop, and after they've had their fill of pornography, they hock it at the nearest pawn shop, and we never see them or the laptop again. I mean, thousands of schools are doing this across America. The state of Maine has been doing it for 10 years, and they start in the seventh grade, but some believe that Idaho students, for whatever reason, aren't capable of taking advantage of this opportunity that thousands and thousands of schools across America already provide. The idea is that these devices, they're not owned by children, they're owned by the school district. The school district will just set policy on how these devices will use. The school district will determine if these devices ever leave campus. But what happens when students have these devices is now this device becomes the textbook for every classroom. No longer are we buying multiple textbooks per student. When the book shows up, it's already outdated. It becomes worn out. It's, it's impossible to update. Students pack around 50-pound backpacks and have, you know, have to go to chiropractor the rest of their lives. Because of technology, we have this opportunity. This device also becomes the advanced math calculator. It's the word processor for every class. It's the research device for science. And then it's a portal to a world of information and knowledge that is available and can be brought into the classroom. When I went to high school 35 some years ago, I went there because that's where I had to go if I wanted access to the most information and knowledge that was available. And it was in the school library and it's what my teacher knew and could share with me. Today, in too many cases when children go to high school, that's when they have least access to the most information and knowledge available to them. Because it's limited to what's in the library. And teachers do not have the tools to bring that world of information and knowledge into the classroom and provide it for every student. So this is, we move towards a 21st century classroom for every school. We continue to focus on with our one-to-one -one devices in our high schools, but at the same time we make considerable investments in technology. And we provide historic amounts of funding for professional development. Uh, more money per year than we've ever spent in Idaho, and it's ongoing. It's critical that teachers year after year after year receive the professional development necessary. If the world is going to, con to continue to change and update quickly, our professional development must do the same for our teachers. Um, let me talk to you real quick now about uh, the uh, great teachers. Teachers are the solution to the challenges we face in education. They are not the problem. It is absolutely critical that we have an education system that keeps the best that we already have and attracts more of the best and brightest into the profession. We know from study after study after study that when a student shows up for school, the most important factor in their academic success is the quality of the teacher in the classroom. Let me share with you just one study that demonstrates this. Dr. Robert Marzano is the go-to guy when it comes to education uh, studies. He studied millions of students in thousands of schools over about a 20-year period of time. Here's what he learned. He was trying to identify what was the most important factor. 
It wasn't how much you spent per student that was important, but it wasn't the most important. It wasn't the curriculum, it wasn't the technology, it wasn't class size. All of those were factors, but by far the most important factor was the teacher in the classroom. Here's what his study showed. If I'm a student that is at the 50th percentile, or in other words, I'm an average student, and I have an average teacher, at the end of the school year, I leave average at the 50th percentile. If I'm that same student, and, I, uh, I, and I'm average at the 50th percentile, and I have a highly effective teacher at the end of that school year, I leave all the way up at the 96th percentile. In one year, a child goes from average all the way to the top of the class because they have a highly effective teacher. That's the good news. Here is the alarming news. Here's news that should trouble any one of us. If that same student is scoring at the 50th percentile and they have an ineffective teacher for just one year, they go from the 50th percentile all the way down to the 3rd percentile in one year. Now, if we know this, and study after study has demonstrated, why would we ever leave it to chance that a student wouldn't, would have a great teacher, a highly effective teacher, every year they're in school? Well, we can't leave it to chance. And a, and a state superintendent, and as a father, and as a grandfather, I'm not going to leave it to chance. We have to have an education system that assures that every child has the opportunity to have a highly effective teacher every year. We had an education system that made it almost impossible to financially reward our great teachers and very, very difficult to deal with ineffective teaching. If we want an education system that truly puts students first, we have to remove the barriers to both. And that's what we did through these laws. We've eliminated tenure. If teach tenure does not benefit students in one way, there's not one study or argument that can be made that tenure puts students first. So if you're a teacher in Idaho and you have tenure, you keep it. But no longer do we give tenure to teachers that are coming into our education system to teach in Idaho. Instead, they will work under the same contract that principals work under in our school districts. And that's a two-year contract with all of the protection and benefits that, that a contract provides, but no longer a guarantee of ongoing permanent uh, contracts. The other thing we did is we eliminated the archaic uh, program of last hired, first fired. What that meant was based on seniority, districts would have to make adjustments to their staff. Let me tell you how that played out. Over and over across Idaho, here's one example. A superintendent told me in a small school district that they had tried for years and years to provide a music program for their students, but they could never attract a music teacher to their district because they were small and isolated. Finally, they did. And over a two-year period of time, this teacher developed a very robust, great music program for every student in the district. Because of declining enrollment, the district had to eliminate one teaching position, unfortunately. They had no choice but to eliminate the music teacher because he was the last hired. How does that put students first? It doesn't. And so we remove those archaic practices uh, that, that do not give principals and school boards the ability to manage their, their teaching staff. The other thing that we did was we put in place the ability to fi finally financially recognize are great teachers in Idaho. How many of you know how teachers are compensated? Let, let, let me tell you real quick how they're compensated. It's based on how many years you've taught and the amount of education you have. It's a grid. So this is how it works. I'm the best teacher in my district, and I've taught eight years and have a master's degree. I make the exact same amount as the most struggling teacher in my district that has taught eight years and has a master's degree. Now, how does that put students first? And, and, and how is that even fair to educators? So what we did was we used the plan that we developed over about a two-year period of time with all the stakeholders in education, and we implemented a pay-for-performance plan that is by far the most robust in the country. And what it says is that you will continue to be paid a base, which is how many years you've taught the amount of education you have, but now on top of that, you're going to have the opportunity to earn individual and group bonuses. Teachers now in Idaho have the ability to earn up to $8,000 a year in bonuses. $40 million this coming school year is going to be distributed to Idaho's teachers. 85% of them are going to get a bonus. 
Average teacher pay in Idaho because of this plan is going to go up over $2,000. Probably the largest increase in, t in teacher pay in the country, and by far the largest increase in teacher pay that we've seen in Idaho in, in decades. And how does this plan work? Real quick, there's two ways a teacher can earn an individual bonus. One is if they teach in a hard-to-fill position. The local district will determine what the hard-to-fill position is. And then the state will provide them extra funds to pay individuals that teach in those hard-to-fill positions. The uh, teachers can also earn an individual bonus if they take on a leadership role. For example, if you're a teacher that's willing to mentor, a great teacher, and you're willing to mentor new teachers. Or you're going to write curriculum for the district, or you're going to develop assessments. This, these are things that many teachers already do for little or no compensation. Now the state will provide extra funds so that teachers can be financially rewarded for doing that. And then the third way teachers can earn a bonus is through student achievement. Now when it comes to student achievement, we do not go down to the individual teacher level. We never want the perception or, or the reality that teachers in a given school are competing with each other on how their students perform academically. We want to foster collaboration and teamwork so all teachers in the school work together. The math teacher, the music teacher, the history teacher, the PE teacher, the science teacher, everybody works together. And if they meet the academic goals, then everybody in the school receives an equal bonus. Um, it, and it's important that you understand that we're not focusing on how many kids can pass a test. Well, that's not what we're measuring. We're measuring how much growth did the children have the year they were in that school. And when we use that model, most of the pay for performance money goes to those schools that have the most struggling populations because that's where the most opportunity for growth is. If I'm in a school where everybody's already performing at a high level, it's difficult to show a lot of growth. But if I'm teaching in a school where students struggle academically, that's where the greatest opportunity is for growth. And so we've created a plan that puts incentives in place for those great teachers to go to the schools that need them the most. Now, real quick, let me talk briefly about transparent accountability. What this basically does is it provides you and tax, taxpayers and patrons and teachers the ability to get information on what their schools are doing academically and fiscally. We already re, uh, publish a fiscal or an academic report card. We're now going to publish a fiscal report card for every school district and school so that you can get answers to um, important questions like, what is the average teacher pay in my district? What is the average per people spending in my district? And, and how does that compare with other districts around the state? How much does my district spend on administration versus the classroom? And how does that compare with other districts around the state? And so you can ask informed que uh, questions of, of your school board. The other thing that we require through transparent accountability is now all labor negotiations have to happen in open meetings. No longer do they happen behind closed doors. So that you can observe them, other teachers can observe them, and, uh, and, and that transparency, because this is, we've just completed the second year of this, that transparency has created some of the most civil uh, and productive uh, negotiations that school districts have had. It, I, I did this when I was on the Nampa School Board. When you get behind closed doors, both sides, it's amazing what people will say and do when they know it's not being observed, it's not going to be reported. But once it's out in the open, uh, it, it, it's amazing how civil and, and uh, reasonable people become. So that's, in a nutshell, the laws that were passed. The, we, we're 18 months into this. We're beginning to start our second year under these laws. I, I, I want to open it up for questions now, and, and, then, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, but I would hope that you would ask, you know, there's, there's a lot of misinformation out there. I hope you would ask those questions that make you are puzzled as to how could something that like that possibly be good for education. Feel free to ask those questions. Yes, sir. Where does all of this sit with uh, Idaho's charter schools? Well, uh, charter schools are public schools, so they are treated the same as our traditional schools. So everything that I explained to you is all part, uh, the laws are all applicable and part of public charter schools just like they are traditional schools. Yes, sir. How many classrooms are there in the entire state of Idaho, K through 12? We have uh, we have 711 schools. Uh, we have about 13,000 classroom teachers. So, you know, around 13,000 classroom teachers. And that 
Is that budget that you projected on the screen at the very first, in terms of uh, cost, is there any major thing that that doesn't cover? Such as maintenance? Yeah, yeah, it does not cover facilities, right? So that happens through local property tax. Um, so it does not cover that. And then some school districts run supplemental levies, uh, which would just subsidize that money for, you know, more classroom dollars to be spent. But probably the biggest thing that that does not cover is, uh, well, two things. M uh, the facilities, but also there's a considerable amount of... Uh, uh, federal dollars that come into schools that go into classrooms that no, are not included in that number. Yes, sir. Uh, on the laptop side, if students don't have access to the internet, uh, is, that, is, is there going to be an extension that somehow the home is going to be provided the internet service? So, so the question is, is if students do not have access, internet access at home, and, and how, what role does does the, the laptop play? I, I understand that these devices are primarily for the school, and that if students take online classes or any of that, that all happens at the school, and the school is connected, it is a wireless environment. If districts choose to allow students to take the devices home, then they'll have to deal with, is there a connectivity issue? What, what the state of Maine has done, for example, those schools that allow students to take them home, they don't require internet access for what they need to do at home. For example, the textbooks are loaded on the device. Any assignments they want them to work on, they're loaded on the device. They do not have to have internet access. So that's one solution. But, but I, want to, I want to emphasize that your local school board will decide if these devices ever leave campus. Yes, sir. How often are the devices upgraded? So when we looked at the uh, thousands of schools and large districts in like the state of Maine, uh, how they manage this, what we found is the best way to approach this is what is referred to as a managed service. So we're not going to buy the devices uh, and then maintain them and repair them and replace them. What we do is we work with an a, 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 a in, a entity where for so many dollars per year per student, they provide the device, they provide the repair, the replacement, the updates, uh, all of that is handled, uh, handled under a managed service contract. And the way it is written is every year 25% of the devices are replaced. So you continually have this refreshing going on. Now, let me tell you how we fund this. We were spending $10 million a year for technology and $10 million a year for textbooks. And the districts are spending about another $3 million a year on textbooks. What we're talking about is taking the money that we have and spending it differently. We also are no longer paying $18,000 retirement bonuses to adults. That is saving us millions of dollars a year that we're transitioning into the classroom. But that's how we keep them refreshed. We're not going to end up with a bunch of devices and then have no way to replace them or refurbish them in the future. This is built into an ongoing foundation funding for our schools. Yes, sir. Do you feel that the money spent on computers is better spent than money spent on teachers, teacher salaries? Well, understand that the biggest portion, the largest increase in our budget this year has not been for technology. It's been for teacher salaries. Uh, over $40 million of new money is going to be distributed to our teachers this year. that also have the ability to earn uh, an increase for teaching an additional year. And also they'll have the ability to earn a raise if they've uh, gotten more education. So um, I, I think that you always have to find that balance. But understand that today, almost 85% of the money that we spend uh, goes to teacher salaries and benefits. The rest is spent on transportation. The rest is spent on classroom uh, te uh, technology uh, and, and opportunities for, for students. So, I, so I, I think what we found is that, like I said before, the most important factor is the quality of the teacher, and that's, that's where the dollars are, are focused. But, but we have to give teachers the tools, uh, and that's what, that's what we're doing. Okay, let me, let me, one more question, then I'll wrap it up. Is that all right, Steve? Yes, sir. Tom, could you just talk a little bit about, you know, I, I think when you look at your chart, you know, if we look at that in real dollars, you know, the, the classrooms at the school districts have taken, you know, quite a hit. 
from an overall standpoint to where a lot of school districts now have you know a month or less um, liquidity left in their on their balance sheets and their uh, the majority of the school districts now are operating on supplemental levies now can you just talk a little bit about where you see your recommendations for funding going in the next couple of years I think uh, for fortunately I think you're going to see uh, us be able to start building the funding back up we did it this past year you saw uh, almost a 6% uh, increase in funding for public education. That's after uh, three years uh, of cuts. I think as long as the economy continues to clip along, we'll be able to start seeing that money restored. Uh, Governor Otter said last dollar cut, first dollar restored. Uh, education was the last thing cut, and some things were completely eliminated, and I could go, if I had time, I'd go into detail. But I think you'll see it, uh, you know, as the economy improves, I don't think we're ever going to go back to those days where we saw the kind of increases in state revenues that gave us the ability to make the kinds of increases that we started taking for granted in education and, and many other parts of, uh, of government. But uh, I think you see that as the money is there, you will see more uh, of it going into education. And, and I think that's the right way. And then the question is how do we spend it? Uh, and uh, we've put together a plan on how to spend the new monies going forward. Let, let, let me just end with this real quick, folks. Um, I, I got my granddaughter, Chloe, here. And I think she was making herself a little bit known here, if I could see out of my corner of my eye. But um, uh, we're expecting our eighth grandchild. And uh, she's going to be born um, in July. Uh, they've already named her. Her name is Penny. But let me, let me tell you a little bit about Penny. Penny is going to graduate from high school in the year 2030. Can you imagine that? Can, 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 and let, let me ask you a question. Do you, can you imagine what the world is going to look like in the year 2030? And I don't think we can. We can't even predict with the changes in economies and governments and technologies and, and improvements in communications. Things are changing so fast. But now ask yourselves, what is Penny going to have to know and be able to do when she graduates from high school in 2030 in order to be successful in that world that awaits her? And the question is, we can't even imagine what that world will look like. Now ask yourself this question and give it a very honest answer. Do we have an education system today that can adapt enough and change enough and is flexible enough and can adapt quick enough to make sure that when Penny graduates from high school in the year 2030 that she'll be ready for the world that awaits her? And the honest answer is no. We have an education system that is too rigid. It resi it's resistant to change, it's not flexible, it cannot adapt quick enough to make sure that when my grandchildren and your grandchildren and the, wor and, and the 282,000 students in Idaho schools today graduate from high school, that they have the ability to live the American dream like you and I are living it today. We put forward a plan that is going to take our education system that direction to make sure that every child has the ability to live the American dream and live in a, a prosperous world like we've enjoyed in our lifetimes. And that's, that's what we're focusing on. That's what we're determined to do. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. And I'll stick around afterwards if any of you have any uh, questions you'd like to ask, and we'll spend some more time talking. Th thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Tom, for, for that information. Tom and his staff have put on your tables a booklet uh, containing some of the information that's uh, in the slideshow. Please feel free to take that with you and, and look at it. If you have questions, there's an email address in there to ask questions, or you can go to the State Department of Education Student Come First website and, uh, and gather additional information. Thank you very, very much, Tom. Let's have another round of applause for Tom. <laughs>